Hey, it's Rassicus. It's been a while since I put out a proper video. If you're wondering where I've been, I'm still active online, but I've been going to school in person, I have a social life, yada yada yada. But thanks to the most recent Splatoon developer interview, I return. In April, I bought the issue of Mitsu Magazine that the interview was in. Then I spent my weekend translating the entire thing. And then a few weeks after that, the interview was posted online with tons more information added to it that just about doubled the length of the interview, and I spent another several days translating that. Now I'll be covering this entire interview in video format because there's some interesting stuff in there, and I know many would rather listen to a video about it than read a nearly 50 page long Google document. As I go through this interview, I will be giving my own thoughts and some additional information throughout in terms of not only Splatoon trivia, but also my translation notes and real world cultural context. Before we dive in, I'd like to say that this interview is pretty long, so for an easier listening experience, my friend Ardnin, who I've collaborated with in the past on the Octo Expansion Retranslation mod, as well as the Inkling Language video, is here to lend his voice as the interviewer. This interview is called Splatoon 3, Half a Year After Launch Developer Interview, The Relationship Between New Agent 3 and Small Fry, Why Special Weapons Resemble Those in Splatoon 1, and a deep dive into the rugged Splatlandian inkling world. Now this interview is with Hisashi Nogami, the producer of Splatoon, Seita Inoue, the art director, and Shintaro Sato, the programming director. And of course there is the interviewer who again will be voiced by Ardman. Page 1. The first section is titled What Parts Should and Should Not Be Changed. Six months have passed since Splatoon 3's release. It sold 3.45 million units within three days of its launch, and 10 million units worldwide within the first three months. How do you feel about sales so far? Inoue. Honestly, I'm quite happy that so many people have picked up the game. We had a major goal of establishing the relatively young IP, Splatoon, as a standard title, and I think we've taken the first step towards that goal. Nogami. At the time of the game's release, many people had been playing since Splatoon 2, but around the end of that year, many people picked up Splatoon for the first time. I feel that the age range of the Splatoon community is broadening. Sato. It makes me glad to see that even those around me who have not played the series before are getting enthusiastic about it. While there's a growing number of new players with Splatoon 3, there's also been some harsh opinions about the game's updates from existing players. Sato. Due to the popularity of the Nintendo Switch, we've been getting feedback from users of all ages with different gaming experiences. It may take some time for us to consider the content and implement updates, but we will do our best to respond to the player's enthusiasm as much as possible. Nogami. Splatoon 3 is a new game, so we're putting as much effort into the new parts of it as we are into the parts that shouldn't be changed, all in order to make the game interesting to as many people as possible. On our end, we're doing our best, but it is difficult to respond to all the feedback. We have two years of updates planned, so we will continue development while taking care of the health of our staff. At the game's launch, there were many communication errors and interruptions in matchmaking. Were there network-related changes that influenced this? Sato. Since the game is played over the internet, unexpected things can happen when many people are connected. We are currently working to fix and improve things one by one. I get the impression that the balancing changes in 3 are not as heavy compared to those from when Splatoon 2 was released. Is there any difference in the intent of these balancing changes? Sato. There is no difference in our intentions when it comes to balancing, and we've been consistently making adjustments to the content to make it more like the first Splatoon game. As many people are attached to their weapons, we're careful to not suddenly make them feel totally different. The only thing I'd say is that we made a lot of big changes to Splatoon 2 at the time of its release, so the post-launch adjustments we made to make it easier to play, and more like Splatoon 1, ended up being big changes. So from around the time when the final Splatfest in Splatoon 2 ended, from Splatoon 2 we gradually prepared for Splatoon 3. However, there were many new elements that we could not properly determine how to adjust until after the player base had spent time using them. For this reason, in Splatoon 3 we've made changes to many things at a time after being able to sufficiently evaluate it such as the adjustments made in version 3.1.0 at the end of March. Indeed. So far, weapons like the Crab Tank have undergone significant changes in how it's assessed by the players. So your policy is to consider the best balancing adjustments based on such assessments? Nogami. 
That's right, some mains and specials take some getting used to, but once you do, you'll be able to use them to their full potential. And then when someone says, this weapon is strong when used like this, the way other players use it may also change. For this reason, we make adjustments while taking into account the long-term changes in the community as a whole. Sato. If all capabilities of a weapon are fully exploited from the beginning with no new discoveries after that, it may seem boring in some respects. Nogami. We have our own expectations of what we think will happen, but there are some things that we think shouldn't happen. We've been looking at the data as well as everyone's reactions as we consider what kind of adjustments to make. To sum it up so far, Splatoon 3 has sold really well, and the Splatoon team has been wanting to establish the game as a continuing mainline Nintendo series, so we should expect to see more Splatoon games in the future. And the Splatoon team seems to be pushing to make the game feel a bit more like Splatoon 1 in terms of balancing. It's also good to know that the developers are at least aware of some of the criticisms, another big one of which will come up in this interview soon. Now for the next section, which is titled Utilizing the power of the number three. Now, please tell us about the concept behind Splatoon 3. There are three numbers of deep cut, tricolor battles, the tri-stringer. Were ideas developed by tying it all to the number three? Inoue. Three was one of the core parts of our overall concept. In games and movies, the third film in a series is often referred to as the culmination of the series, but I believe it also has a celebratory appeal to it. The celebratory, festive atmosphere of 3 is also suitable for expressing chaos, another main theme of Splatoon 3. We've also mixed various 3 elements together. Here Inoue goes on to explain some wordplay that will require a lot of translation notes. The Japanese name of Deep Cut is Surimi Rengo. The surimi in the name on its own means fish paste, like artificial crab, for example. However, the suri in surimi is supposed to play on the English word three, which is read like suri, since there's no th sound. And mi is another reading of the kanji for three. Inoue finishes by saying, for other elements, if we could put a three motif into it, odds were high we'd use it. Nogami. It's more puns, as per usual. There sure are a lot of threes in it. The name Surimi Rengo fits the three theme so well that I thought you might have had it in mind for a long time. Inoue. While it was hard to come up with a good idea, when it suddenly came to me, I immediately used it. For their catchphrase, I thought there wouldn't be anything that could live up to the stay fresh or don't get cooked, stay off the hook, so I was surprised such a fitting catch ya later popped into mind. Here, of course, Inoue is talking about the Japanese version of the phrases Stay fresh is Ika Yoroshiku when directly translated Squid best regards and Don't get cooked, stay off the hook is Nuritakuru tentakuru which means ink it up tentacle Now for deep cuts, catch ya later It's Hona Kaisan which means something like Well then, let's call it here But the word Kaisan is a play on the word for seafood Kaisan Butsu Additionally, the kana in Kaisan can also be switched around to make Ikasan or Squid 3. I actually think the localization team did a good job on these catchphrases in keeping the same spirit. In both languages, the Squid Sisters catchphrase is a short, catchy sign-off phrase that isn't really a pun, but it just sounds good. Off the hook having some kind of rhyming scheme in both parts of their phrase. And then deep cut using a less common goodbye phrase that you've heard before, but with a fish pun hiding in there. So, with this being Splatoon 3, as mentioned, were you aiming for this to be a culmination of the series? Inoi. It is a culmination, but I also wanted to express the power of the number 3. This is something that could only be done with the numbered title. I believe there's a theme of chaos in addition to 3 in this game. Did you develop concepts after the victory of Chaos in Splatoon 2's final Splatfest, Chaos vs. Order? Also, did you consider what it would be like if Order had won? Inoue. There were some vague ideas before the final Splatfest, but it wasn't until afterwards that things started getting more fleshed out. So, if Order had won, we would have gotten a very different Splatoon 3 from what we have now. Inoue. That's right. With how we were giving our all to Splatoon 2 to the very end, there wasn't too much time to think about what was going to happen next. I feel that the graphics have evolved in Splatoon 3. Does this mean that you've mastered the capabilities of the Switch's hardware? Inoue. I think the main reason is not so much that we've mastered the hardware, but rather that we have more know-how. 
As for the design aspect, we did not make major design changes to the player characters and weapons, so we're able to further refine the graphics. Sato. Since the game deals with ink, it seems that some of our basic research on ink has advanced. In the previous games, the splashes from shooting were represented by textures, but this time they are represented by polygons. So said accumulated know-how has allowed us to focus our efforts on the areas where we need to. Such secrets to the ink. One of the things you have adopted for the game is a seasonal system. How did that come about? Sato. The seasonal system wasn't something we were thinking of doing from the very start. As the number of players increases, the purpose of playing Splatoon grows as well. We wanted to add more things that go up as the players continue to play the game, not just a rank that changes based off of wins and losses. So for this, we thought that something that changes over a period of time and fits the world of Splatoon is fashion. And this led to the creation of the catalog system. The current form of the catalog was created with the idea that as the catalog is updated, new items will be added to the Splatoon world as time progresses. This makes it easy to talk about periods of time in Splatoon and creates a more festive atmosphere. It feels players have a good chance to start even in the middle of the season. On the other hand, there may be cases where players leave in the middle of the season. Are Splatfests and Big Run the way to fill that gap? Nogami. The number of players increases at the beginning of a new season, but we have a steady stream of players at other times of the year as well, and we haven't seen a big drop in the number of players just because it's the middle of the season. We believe that people are playing with a sense of balance, finding new goals every three months of the season. Sato. For example, if you add one new weapon per week, the update will only be relevant to those who are interested in that weapon. However, if you add many elements together for a season, the content becomes relevant not only to you, but for a variety of players. True. Immediately after an update, it's easier to have teams full of new weapons compared to the previous games. It feels like a festival in a way. Nogami. It's nice when there are many people having fun together at the same time, and I feel it's more exciting to concentrate on the game to create a topic of conversation among the players. As is the case with other games, I think the increase or decrease in playtime depends largely on the rhythm of everyone's life. Many play only on their days off, but the number of players increases on weekends and continues to increase during long holidays. On the other hand, it tends to decrease once the holidays are over, as well as during periods of change, such as a new school year, probably because people are busier in their normal lives. It seems that many play because of Splatfest and Big Run, as during this time the number of people playing increases at once, and the trend continues to be high for a while. Incidentally, the largest daily player base in Splatoon 2 was during the first anniversary Splatfest, but the most recent Splatfest in 3 had a much larger daily player base than that. I see that the number of players has increased considerably. Regarding the battles, why are the battle game modes the same as in Splatoon 2? Sato. In the world of Splatoon, turf wars are an enduringly popular sport. I don't think that will change in the future. So one reason is to stay consistent with the setting. Another reason is that we want to make sure that a variety of people can play the game, and if we add more game modes, we will have to ask people to figure out new rules. On the other hand, we cannot reduce the number of old game modes in order to add new ones. Every game mode must be someone's favorite, so we decided to refine each game mode rather than get rid of the existing ones. What's the ratio of each mode played? Nogami. It depends on the time of day, but Anarchy Open, Anarchy Challenge, Regular Battle, and Salmon Run are played in roughly equal proportions. In total, the ratio of X battles is less than 10% of the total. Even among those who have reached S+, it seems that many of them play X battles and Anarchy battles separately. One more characteristic of Splatoon 3 is that the stages feel more long and narrow compared to Splatoon 2. Was it a conscious decision to structure the stages like this? Sato. The shape of the stages isn't something we decide on ahead of time. Not just in Splatoon 3, but throughout the series, what we kept in mind when creating stages is what kind of play and ingenuity can be created in the characteristic parts of the stages. In addition, we also create the layouts needed for each rule set. The optimum shape of that layout will change, influenced by the main and special weapons that appear in each game. Various objects on the stages have recently been added through updates, but in the past, when stages were being renovated, they would sometimes take them out of rotation with an announcement that they were under construction. Nogami. We did not decide in advance how to revamp the game at that time, but rather we made adjustments according to how players played and the situation at the time, and we plan to do the same this time as well. 
I think the biggest piece of criticism that I've seen in regards to Splatoon 3's gameplay is the map design, and I'm glad to see those criticisms brought directly to the developers. The interviewer was definitely referring to things like hallway maps and um, major map adjustments loved by the community, such as Wahoo World Pole. Though the answers given by the developers here were unsurprisingly PR-ish, which is fair. It's not like they can just outwardly say in this situation, yeah, the maps are bad, sorry. Analyzing Splatoon in terms of gameplay is not my wheelhouse, but to sum up what the issue is, stages in the previous games were a lot wider and allowed more options for flanking, or it gives some space for people learning the game or weapons to be able to hang back and paint while still contributing something to their team. But in 3, we have these stages that are super narrow and long and don't give so many options for movement, and it forces players into combat in these choke points, and I honestly think that this change has made some of Splatoon 3 stages, especially Turf Wars, feel worse to play on compared to Splatoon 2's stages. If you're interested in hearing more about this topic from people who actually know what they're talking about, I recommend this video called Why Splatoon 3's Maps Fail and How to Fix Them by Prochara with FLC and Bipedal Squid. I'm hoping they do those major renovations that the interview was just talking about. With two years of updates planned, have you decided on the ratio of returning stages to new stages? Sato. When it comes to stages, the most important question is, what are the hottest locations in the Inkling world? Since Splatoon 3 is set in Splatsville, stages near there tend to be what's in. Hammerhead Bridge is such a place, isn't it? Sato. We wanted to express the change in time, so the completion of the long under-construction bridge is a reminder of how seven years have passed. The completion of the bridge is what led to a boom in Splatlandian sensibilities, so Hammerhead Bridge is a stage that represents Splatoon 3 in a way, and although the name is the same as before, it's a new stage in terms of gameplay. Inoi. For Inklings and Octolings, battling out in Splatlands is the trend right now. Therefore, they've also moved to the Splatlands, and spots around Splatsville are appearing as stages. There's a sense of geographical relationships, with the Neil statue being visible from Hammerhead Bridge. Sato. One of the features of Splatoon is that time flows even in the game, so we tried to make the flow of time felt even in the smallest details of the stages. By the way, is it possible to bring back Shifty Stations? Sato. Shifty Stations are located in a mysterious place that Marina had arranged through mysterious connections. There may be a way to get back there if we can figure out how. However, it seems difficult as Marina is also busy as a musician. In its mysterious nature, it's also unknown if the same locations are even still there. The article goes on to explain Shifty Stations, which were gimmicky turf war stages made for Splatoon 2's Splatfests. In-universe, they were made by Marina, and different ones were prepared for each Splatfest. They then bring up the Triforce-shaped stage made for the Legend of Zelda Splatfest in Splatoon 3, implicitly comparing that to Shifty Stations in its exclusivity and gimmickiness. Now onto the next section, which focuses on weapons, and is titled... The reason for adding stringers and Splatanas? Because they're cool. In some matches, it feels easy to get pitted up against weapons that are the same class as your own. Is this intentional? Sato. The matchmaking system of Splatoon 2 did not divide the teams well in some ways, so this time we introduced a new matchmaking system. However, I feel that we need to continue to pursue the balance between making sure that there is no bias towards one type of weapon and providing a fresh experience each time the player plays the game. So the current state of the matchmaking system isn't perfect, and we plan to continue making adjustments to it in the future. So we got a critique of the matchmaking system. I honestly feel that the matchmaking in 3 is better than 2, but yeah, it's not perfect. Pretty PR-ish answer, but nice to see that they still intend to adjust it more. A commendation system has been added to the post-battle results. Sato. Splatoon is a game in which everyone works together to win battles. There are parts of the game that can be expressed numerically, such as the number of opponents splatted and turf inked, but there are also things that cannot be expressed when playing for victory. Since players are matched with other players who are close in rank, there are times when you can't win, yet you must have done your best in some way. We felt that it'd be a pity if such efforts went unrecognized, so we introduced the Commendation System, or Medals. The Stringers and Splatanas are new weapon classes in the game. Why were these weapons chosen? Inoi. Well, 
because they're cool. Pretty straightforward. One of the reasons is that I had this idea of a character with a bow standing in the rugged landscape and that became part of the first promotional trailer. When we implemented the dualies, we chose them because it's Splatoon 2 and there's two guns. We like to have things like that that are easy to understand. But of course, it was not only about how cool it looked, but also about whether or not it could actually be used as a weapon. I get the impression that neither of these new weapons are all that easy to use. Sato. As long as we are creating a new class of weapons, we want to create an experience that is unique to it. As a result, it's necessary for them to feel differently from the conventional weapons. I think that's part of the weapon's individuality and charm, and that's something we aim for. Nogami. The most important thing is to create a pleasant moment when using the weapon, such as hitting the target with all three shots with the stringer, or using a splatana to kill with a charged slash at just the right moment. Some players seem to feel that there are only a few new weapons, with the Splattershot Nova, Big Swig Roller, Snipe Rider, in addition to stringers and splatanas. Sato. In reality, aside from the Brellas and Dooleys, the only new weapons that were released right after release of Splatoon 2 were the Clash Blaster, Squeezer, and Goo Tuber. Therefore, although the number of new weapons has not changed much, in Splatoon 3 we have made all the weapons available from the beginning, so the number of additional weapons may seem relatively small. I have the impression that many of the special weapons are based on the motives on Splatoon 1. Did you incorporate some things from Splatoon 1 as a culmination of the series? Inoue. From an artistic point of view, the concept of Splatoon is to portray the counterculture of the youth. Therefore, we decided on the direction of Splatoon 3 to be something that had the feeling of being a counter to the counterculture, and to give off that impression that Splatoon 1 had, yet as something that has developed further. Sato. Since many people started with 2, we also wanted to give them a taste of some of the elements that did not appear in that game. However, considering the time that has passed since Splatoon 1 and keeping the culture of the Splatlands in mind, we thought that the special weapons of Splatoon 1 must have been modified and made more flashy, so we decided to introduce those weapons into Splatoon 3. Inoue. For us, it was important to draw from the trend of heavily modifying and then using old things equals fresh. How did tricolor battles come about? Sato. With the three in the name, from the start we wanted to have a three-color battle. However, if we simply increase the number of teams while sticking with the same standard Turf War rules, we expected various issues to occur, such as just one team being attacked too intensively. On the other hand, since Splatoon 2 we had the idea of creating asymmetrical battles in which the attackers and defenders would be divided into two sides. We thought that we could solve the problem by mixing the two, and thus tricolor battles were born. Nogami. Since it requires more balancing adjustment than regular two-color battles, we decided to release one stage for tricolor battles at each Splatfest. I think it's good that we've been able to produce differences with each Splatfest as a result of that. There seems to be a high technical hurdle to it. Sato. That's true. However, our researcher in charge of programming helped it take shape more smoothly than expected. I have the impression that the more Splatfests happen where a player is an attacker on tricolor, the less I get attacked by other attackers. Do you think the rules are spreading more widely among players? Sato. Yes, in addition to that, I think there's also an emotional aspect to it. I wanted to create a subtle state of the other attacking team being both an opponent and an ally. When you see someone with an ultra signal, you tend to attack them, right? Your own team gets more points for securing the signal, so I think that kind of delicate relationship of interests is interesting. Dogami. It seems that players have developed their own strategies, such as fighting together as allies to win at just the right time, despite being opponents. I think it's interesting to hear what thoughts went into Splatoon in an artistic sense, and also what was planned for Splatoon 2 and never made it. And that, because it's cool, feels like a core part of Splatoon's design philosophy, doesn't it? With some weapons, I can feel that pleasant moment that Nogami talks about, and I think it's a factor in Splatoon's appeal to me in terms of gameplay, and why I've latched onto certain weapons. Now we're on to page two, and from here we're finally going to hear more lore-related information. The first section gets more into the concepts behind Splatsville, especially in terms of real-world culture. It is titled, Chaos with a Sense of Reality and an Exotic Air. I feel like Splatsville has a kind of Asian atmosphere to it. 
Please tell us more about the concepts and imaginings behind Splatsville. Inoue. Keeping with the 3 concept, we designed the city to have a 3D structure. The motif of the city was inspired by the densely populated areas in Asia, where various buildings are crammed together from top to bottom. This also works to depict the chaos that is often seen in rapidly developing cities, with all the old and new buildings joined together. The monuments in Splatsville depict a bird, snake, and a pig. Why were these animals chosen? Inoue. The chicken, snake, and pig are three animals that symbolize worldly desires known as the Three Poisons in Buddhism. This fits well with the impression that Splatsville gives off and represents how Splatsville is a city with history to it. In Buddhism, the Three Poisons are greed, represented by a bird, hatred, represented by a snake, and delusion, represented by a pig. These animals are also tied to each of the members of Deep Cut by the naming of each of their versions of Anarchy Poisons, which is a song that they sing on the first day of Splatfests. The bird mix of Anarchy Poisons is sung by Shiver, the snake mix by Fry, and the boar mix by Big Men. We see restaurants and eateries open during Splatfest, but do they only open during Splatfests? Inoue. There are restaurants here and there, but the ones facing the alleys seem to have a lot of energy to them during Splatfests. Is there any reason why there are so many sea cucumber phone users in Splatsville? Inoue. Those phones, with its sturdiness and the strength of its antenna, which can be connected anywhere, make it suitable for the Splatlands. It has a significant share of the market. Page 151 of the Splatoon 3 art book talks a little bit more about these phones, and it basically says what Inoue just said. And if the sea cucumber in the name makes you wonder if these phones have any ties to Octo Expansion or the Deep Sea, it does. The advertisement here is written in Deep Sea Stencil script, and this script has only appeared in Octo Expansion, like on signs and such in the Deep Sea and nowhere else. And not only that, the logo here is identical to that on the CQ card you get in Octo Expansion. So it seems this CQ company has expanded their business beyond the Deep Sea. The lobby is high tech, with the introduction of the copy machine and player ghosts. Is this a technology born out of the times? Inoue. Splatsville is undergoing rapid redevelopment. In our world, it is often the case that the latest technology is introduced in such rapidly redeveloping places, so I wanted to depict that kind of situation. I see. Only the area around the station has a high-tech feel. It's a different atmosphere from the back alleys. Inoue. Other parts of the city have yet to catch up in that way. The lobby is being developed under the leadership of the brand Squid Force, as they're responsible for those technical developments. Squid Force seems to be making a lot of money. There are many advertisements for them on the screens in the lobby. Inoue. Yeah, they're like a multinational corporation. Nogami. Ranked Battles 2 was a street sport played secretly in back alleys by a handful of inklings back in the Splatoon 1 days. But as it has become more and more sophisticated and the number of competitors have increased, it has transitioned into a major sport with many companies involved. Is the music played in the lobby like a radio? Sato. A jellyfish DJ located on the second floor of the lobby plays the music. Usually, the music is selected depending on the time of day and the atmosphere, but there are special times when he plays music based on a particular theme. Nogami. Those special times are the same all over the world, so I think people can exchange opinions when playing with their friends, like, oh, this song is good. About how often is this special time? Sato. It comes every day, usually at a certain time, so please check it out. By the way, I'm pretty sure the special time being referred to here is like, for example, the hours where Ink Theory and High Tide Era get played, or hours where they play Squid Squad music. There's more and more locker items, and the locker alone doesn't feel like enough space. Is there anything you can do to expand it? Sato. Thanks for enjoying the lockers. While I think how you use the limited space is the fun part, I understand your desire to put a lot of things in there. So from Sato's answer, it doesn't sound like there will be more locker size upgrades. At the very least, I'm hoping they'll add a function to save locker layouts, but who knows. Anyways, we're on to the next section titled Deep Cut, the lovable Splatlandian adversaries. During Splatfests, the city feels even more festive than in the previous games. Inoue. In the previous entries of the series, we wanted to make the Splatfests feel like a live concert. But this time, traditional festival in a historical town plus Splatfest was the concept that we developed. We thought that if we could depict the Splatfests as like a Shinto ritual, we could express Splatsville as a city of chaos with a sense of reality to it. 
Nogami. Although the main Splatfest lasts for 48 hours, we set aside the Splatfest sneak peek so that those who are unable to attend due to time conflicts can still enjoy a bit of the festive atmosphere. Please tell us about Deep Cut, who are living up the city during Splatfests. Inoue. We started the creation of Deep Cut by thinking of them not only as the representatives of Splatfests, but also as lovable bad guys. If we were to just make more idols, they'd be going up against the already popular Squid Sisters and Off the Hook. Therefore, we wanted to make a musical group with a slightly different role. Since they're the antagonists, we chose to base them around sharks, mori eels, and rays, predators of squids and octopuses. We designed them to both be active in Splatsville and in story mode. They have the backstory of being a rascally bunch, yet are popular representatives of historic clans. They do have that feeling of being a little bit bad. Nogami. Well, that's because they're truly Bankara. Bankara is the Japanese name of the Splatlands, but it is a real word that means rough and uncouth, but there's more to it. I'll get more into that in a second. In one of the Sunken Scrolls, they were called the Hometown Hype Squad, but in reality, they're a band of thieves. So does that mean they have both a public image and a secret side to them? Inoi. Basically, they really are that hometown hype squad, but the financial situation in their hometown is so bad that they've taken up banditry to earn money. I see. I find it unique that Big Man isn't humanoid. Inoi. Originally, I wanted to make a group of three since it's Splatoon 3. I wanted a non-humanoid member to be, despite appearances, the most sensible person in the group. Nogami. Big Man can be a bit biased towards himself, though. I want to take a second to show some of the concepts for Big Man from the Splatoon 3 art book. We can see a garden eel, some other kinds of fish I can't even identify, and even a Kohawk salmonid. One concept to note is him as a severed tentacle octarian, and it seems this idea was considered for even longer than the others have, as it appears in more than one piece of art. By the way, the battle with Big Man and story mode seemed very close to Phantom Manta and Super Mario Sunshine. Was this intentional? Inoi. Ink, Manta Ray, Boss, just had to make a reference to it. Right, right. The way Shiva speaks makes her sound like someone from Kyoto. What's the motive here? Inoi. The motifs of Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 were based on Western culture, so we wanted to mix in elements that differed from that. This specific thing, of course, gets lost in translation, but Shiver speaks in a Kyoto dialect, for example using dosu instead of desu. This is tied to how she acts like a traditional Japanese rakugo storyteller who depicts stories with head tilts and fan waves. And in the Kyoto style of rakugo, it's less refined and incorporates music, and that ties into Deep Cut's musical and chaotic nature. Beyond the inspirations for her design, there isn't really an in-universe lore reason given for the way that she speaks, but there is for Fry, where, in the Japanese version, she has speech patterns that are associated with the Hiroshima dialect. However, the way she speaks also makes her sound old-fashioned, and even more so because she uses the personal pronoun washi, which is most commonly used by old men. It was revealed in the art book that Fry's habit of using the pronoun washi was picked up from her grandfather, who raised her. A video was released of the vocalists for Shiva and Fry recording music, and they both seem to resemble their respective characters. Did you make the designs similar after casting? Inoi. It really happened by chance, as was the case with the Squid Sisters and Off the Hook. It's a miraculous coincidence, the character designs were decided on first, they were casted based off the impressions of only the voices and songs. By the way, does Big Man's vocalist also resemble him? Inoi, Big Man is a mystery. I'll be looking forward to when that information comes to light. Their music and choreography have a Japanese flavor to it. What is the concept behind this? Inoi. The concept is not necessarily Japanese, but rather a mix of exotic flavors. The word bankara was originally coined as a direct antonym for haikara, so if you feel that there are some strong Japanese elements, it may be due to the Japanese ties to the concept of bankara. Now for some background on what Inoue is talking about exactly. 
Bankara is the Japanese name for the Splatlands, and Haikara is the name of Inkopolis. However, Bankara and Haikara are also actual words in Japanese that have ties to real-world historical fashion movements in Japan. In the mid-1800s, as Japan finally opened its doors to foreign trade after being closed for over 200 years, Western fashion came in tow. And this fashion was adopted into Japanese society, and it was considered modern, clean, and refined. This adoption of Western fashion and ideas came to be known as the High Collar or Haikara movement. But from the Haikara movement, a counter movement emerged where everything about it was in direct opposition to the Haikara movement. And this was the Bankara movement. The name derived from Ban, meaning barbarian, and the Kara from Haikara. They valued the traditional, let their hair grow wild and unkempt, and let their clothes tatter. They also strived for physical and martial prowess as well, to reflect a desire to physically strengthen and protect Japan like the samurai of olden days. It was an intentional, rugged, and unkempt image that they cultivated. As decades went on, however, it became a lot easier to get mass-produced clothing, so to get that same rugged look you really have to be doing it on purpose so it became more of a fad. Nowadays, in the general sense, Haikata has come to mean someone who adopts new trends and is stylish, while Bankata refers to being, like, rough and uncouth. So this is the real-world inspiration behind the rivalry and cultural differences that Splatsville and Inkopolis have, which inevitably gets lost in translation. And if you look at info for Splatoon 3 on the culture of the Splatlands and its characters with this historical context in mind, you'll really see the inspiration shine through. Bankara, in this sense, has been localized to anarchy, which is a solid localization choice to get a sense across of political-slash-fashion movement that gets treated as a trendy thing, but yeah, there's a difference in the details. If you want to learn more about the real-world Bankara movement in an easily digestible form, there's an Unseen Japan article and video on that that I'd recommend. But anyways, that's your history lesson for today. Back to the interview. There's also more tentacle styles that have been added. Is this something that's unique to the Splatlands? Inoi. The idea is that this Splatlandian Bankara fashion craze is sweeping the inkling world, so that's led to these hairstyles becoming popular. This is something that's been brought up a lot, but the reason for the inclusion of the braided style is because a braid has three strands. I see. Okay, what Inoi actually said here was more about the word for braid itself, which literally has the word for three in it. Inoi. Newly added styles like perms, unkempt hair, and eyebrow cuts are in vogue with the Bankara fashion craze. Nogami. Some more extreme treatments of the tentacles, like roasting them, have also gotten popular, but I think that's more so part of the fashion craze rather than an advancement in technology. Inoi. By the way, styling tentacles is kind of like messing with your fingernails, so it doesn't seem to hurt them. I think that's an interesting bit of lore people have been wanting a clear answer to. Cutting and roasting tentacles doesn't seem to hurt. This is not the first time the developers have directly acknowledged inkling haircuts. Back in 2015, in a different interview, Nogami made a reference to a piece of fan art depicting an inkling girl cutting her bangs, saying that this is about what he imagined. It doesn't seem to hurt her here at all either. So this inkling haircuts don't really hurt lore may be something that the Splatoon team have thought about from very early on. Now for the next section, unique characters in the Splatlands. The shopkeepers sure are unique. Regarding Nolly, Eddie, and Nails, is Nails forcing Nolly, Eddie to tag along with them? Inoue. Nails is small, but he's a skilled conversationalist. He recruited Gnarly Eddie, who isn't so great at talking, but has a cool and relaxing vibe to him. Since Nails hired Eddie as a clerk and model for his cool headgear shop, he doesn't seem to mind the shyness. Now, the clothing shop clerk, Jella Fleur, does he have any relation to Gelonzo or Gelfanzo? Inoue. He's among the handful of jellyfish out there who can speak the Inkling language, but he's a species of jellyfish different from Gelfanzo and Gelonzo. He has quite long tentacles which, despite appearances, are poisonous. He acts incredibly cold towards those who are tacky and unfashionable. Both Jella Fleur's English and Japanese name points to him being a flower hat jelly. This species is not in the same taxonomic class as true jellyfishes, but they do resemble them. Just like Jellifleur, flower hat jellies have poisonous little tendrils coming off their bell. How did Mr. Coco come to look the way he does? 
Inoi. It's because he was tempered in the harsh environment of the Splatlands. When you leave your familiar place of residence and go to another city, you are sometimes surprised to find that many people have different physiques and appearances depending on the culture of that city. I tried to express that feeling in his design, and Mr. Coco is what I came up with. Is Harmony still actively a part of Chirpy Chips? Inoi. She is, but on an irregular basis. She spends much of her time in Hotlantis, but when she feels like it, she does sing. Why has Merch grown up so quickly? Inoi. I wanted to do something like when you see a relative's kid for the first time in a while and they've grown up a lot. I feel that little Judd has become more fluffy compared to how he was in Splatoon 2. Inoi. I'd say his fur has gotten more stiff than fluffy. He's always been aiming for Judd's position, but he couldn't achieve it, so he became a bit lazy and ended up like this. Is Marigold, who works at places like the Table Turf Reception and Crab and Go, originally from the Inkling Society? Inoi. She originally is from Splatsville. She's sometimes portrayed as a guide, a clerk, and as someone who we can't be certain is the same person or not. With the opening of the train station, she's been in Inkopolis Plaza, and is doing a lot of different things in Splatsville. Maybe there's another miracle that the player doesn't know about. Rumor has it that she knows everything about Splatsville. I know I'm not alone in this, but I'm interested in what they're going to do with Marigold and Lil Judd, because these look like plot threads that the Splatoon team will touch on later. I mean, I sure hope they do and not just seemingly foreshadow something and then never acknowledge it again. Like, there's all of Little Judd's mysterious connections to Grizzco, like his card sleeves, the headset appears only after you finish story mode, and then the little pencil holder thing in the Grizzco building. While Little Judd's connections to Grizzco isn't brought up in this interview, I'll say his draft design in the art book makes his Grizzco connection as obvious as possible. Like, clearly he's got a major involvement in the company now, but what led up to that? Though honestly, with Little Judd acting cartoonishly evil in a way that feels like a joke, I'd rather it stay a joke. Personally, I'm more invested in whatever's happening with Marigold. She even runs the Grisco counter? That's pretty suspicious. I feel there's a lot more mystery around that. I'm getting more and more curious about her true identity. Next, I'd like to know more about the people in Incopolis. I was particularly shocked by the look of the shoe shopkeeper Fred Crumbs. What did he look like before he got fried? Inoi. He was just an ordinary mackerel before he became fried. He liked shoes, so he applied for a part-time job. And when he found out that the requirement was an extra crispy fashion sense, he became bursting with fried flavor. But before getting fried, he had to get... opened. Nogami. Yeah, I guess that's a necessary part of it. So Fred Crumbs is supposed to be an Aji Fry, which is a horse mackerel that's been butterfly cut open before getting battered and deep fried. On the topic of fried characters, the craziness of Fred Crumbs' design reminds me of one of the unused concepts for Krusty Sean in Splatoon 1. Instead of him just wearing a designer jacket, he was going to be a fully deep fried shrimp, and there's even a drawing of him getting dipping sauce shot at him. They toned down the absurdity for Krusty Sean's final design, but it seems like with Fred Crumbs, they went with something just as over the top. Was he able to wear shoes as a regular horse mackerel? Inoue. He's found that wearing them on his fillets is the most fitting. I thought that shoe shopkeeper has to have a lot of legs. Inoue. They can be either that or fried food. When it comes to fried food, I first think of fried shrimp and then fried horse mackerel. Is getting deep fried a huge thing to prepare for, or is it really not a big deal? Inoue. It's not that big of a deal. In human terms, it's kind of like getting a piercing. Is there a particular reason why he's carrying a lemon wedge around? Inoue. Fried food isn't the best for digestion, so the lemon helps cover that. It's the perfect combination. The lemon is supposed to be like a clutch bag. Are the shoes Fred Crumbs is wearing just for him? Inoue. We asked the designers to come up with a style that fits a deep-fried character. It's not out of the question for those models of shoes to become available for Inklings and Octolings, but for now, those shoes are exclusively for him. What we're trying to express with that exclusiveness is that it could be something that makes someone who likes shoes go, where'd he get those? So he's so serious and loves shoes, to the point that he got deep-fried for his job. Inoue. 
He has a very distinctive appearance, but I think of him as an ordinary young man. In this world, there are many people who look tough on the outside, yet are pretty normal on the inside. That's how I imagine him. Are Krusty Sean and Fred Crumbs acquainted with each other? You know, I, not particularly, no. Krusty Sean is pretty famous among fellow fried folk for his travels to various places. Fred Crumbs at least might know of Krusty Sean one way or another. Krusty Sean's wonder crust journey as seen in the Splatnet app is over, but will we see more of him in the future? Inoue. I haven't thought about it at all yet, but Krusty Sean is a fun-loving guy, so maybe there'll be something else with him in the future. By the way, the food truck he used in Splatoon 2 has been scrapped in Mincemeat Metalworks. I'll try and look for it. Upon translating this portion, I got some friends to go and check for me, and this is true. You can see the truck only on the Bravo team side, off in the corner. When Mincemeat was updated at a tricolor layout, they actually changed the background geometry a little bit, which resulted in the truck being even harder to see. But it's there. Now, please tell me about the relationship between Sheldon, Shelley, and Donnie. Inoue. While they look like the same species, Sheldon is a horseshoe crab, and Shelley and Donnie are tadpole shrimps. They're not related by blood, it's more like Shelley and Donnie admired Sheldon, and they became his apprentices. Sheldon has always had a policy of focusing on the new stores, so he is in charge of the store in Splatsville. So Shelley and Donnie were left in charge of the store in Coppola's Plaza because of their enthusiasm. They seem young and full of energy. You know, I, they can recite Sheldon's lines perfectly. Nogami. I think they worked hard to memorize them. Inoue. A love for weapons is the most important thing to Sheldon, and I think that's the reason why he hired both of them. Is the Incopolis Square store also not closed? Inoue. Yes, it's still open. I believe Sheldon hired someone else to work at that store. We might already know who that someone else might be. During Chaos vs. Order, every major character got a little information blurb. Agent 8's blurb says that they can't sleep at night until every nearby weapon's been methodically cleaned and checked. In fact, I hear Sheldon might be looking to hire 8 to work at Ammo Nights. If it ends up being that we unlock Inkopolis Square after completing Side Order, the same way that we got access to Inkopolis Plaza, it'd be cool to see our customized Agent 8 as the shopkeeper. Annie's fashion has changed due to the influence of music that she likes. What kind of bands is she into? Inoue. She suddenly got addicted to intense, gothic metal bands. She started putting all of her earnings into it, and now dresses in that way. Has the band that she's into not made an appearance in-game yet? Inoue. That's right. In the Inkling world, there's a lot of active bands, more than the ones that have already been depicted in the Splatoon series. Is it a famous band? Inoue. Not really. It's like a band that she's dug up. The band has a strong fan base. I originally designed her with the idea that she's a shopkeeper who gets very intensely into subcultures, but is basically an indoorsy person. I wonder how she looked after seven years had passed, and that's how she ended up. I see that Jalonzo has bought a house, so he's working at the store and settling down? Inoue. Yeah, he's going through the stages of life in order. The house he bought is a used property along a train line. He's been renovating it. So for Spike, did he do a lot of things and run out of money? Inoue. It seems like he made a lot of money, spent a lot of money, but then got tired of it all and came back to Inkopolis. Is changing gear abilities something like an indulgent hobby for him? Inoue. It's more like something he's indulged in for some years, and something that he returns to nowadays when he feels comfortable. From a young person's point of view, he looks really cool, but from an adult's point of view, it's like, is that guy okay? With reasons to admire them and worry about them, it's important to keep that sense of reality to the people in the city. By the way, what became of the relationship between Merch and Spike? Inoue. Those two are from the same northern region, and Merch thought of Spike as a really amazing guy for making a life for himself out in the city. Merch came to the city with a pure heart, but as he sees more and more of the city and learns about the different sides of Spike, he's left conflicted. He's shaken, as he only knows the way of life that Spike taught him. What complicated feelings. By the way, the word I translated earlier as indulgent hobby can literally just mean a hobby, but it's especially used when talking about bad hobbies like drinking or gambling or other risky ventures. 
Considering how the kids think it's cool, the adults think it's concerning, and Merch is left feeling conflicted about Spike after learning more about the business, it would make sense that whatever is involved in the ability-changing business is immoral or even illegal in some way. Who knows how exactly, and with it implied to be a bad thing, I don't think we will learn the specifics of how it works in-universe, and we'll just have to use our imagination. Now we're going on to page 3, and the next section is called An Expansion Pass for the New and the Nostalgic. I'd like to ask you about the concept behind Splatoon 3's music. Inoue. The concept behind the music in Splatoon 3 is based on the keyword bankata, and I wanted to create an atmosphere that is bright, easy to groove to, but still heavy. The music in 3, like the visual art, serves as a counter to Splatoon 2's. We've also been keeping in mind the feelings of primary colors and impulses felt when starting something from the first game. Is Seaside currently the most popular main band in the Inkling world? Inoue. They're the ones with the most momentum. Why did they cover Splatak and Now or Never? Inoue. The members of Seaside aren't a well-behaved bunch. They covered Splatak without permission as a provocation, saying, Come on, we can do Splatak even better than they do. In the case of Now or Never, the vocalist asserts that we were the ones who did it first. If you're interested, the vocalist talks more about this in the Splatoon 3 album jacket. The Splatoon 3 album jacket has in-universe tweets written by Deika, one of the vocalists for Seaside. The album also has an article about Front Row, which goes a little bit more into this information about Ikan leaving and the beef between Beika from Seaside and Ichia from Squid Squad and Front Row. These tweets, as well as other contents of the album jacket, have been fan-translated already, so I'm not going to go over the full thing here. So if you want to read that, I'll put a link in the description. I'm looking forward to it. The members of Front Row hide their faces, but they were members of Squid Squad in Splatoon 1, weren't they? Inoue. Yes. After Ikan, the bass player, left the band, they went on hiatus. They started anew in the Splatlands, masking themselves to give themselves a fresh start. The Squid Sisters have a new song. Was it written for Splatfests? Inoue. Yes, it was. The Splatfests in Splatoon 3 have a first half and a second half, each with a different performance by Deep Cut. To fit with this, we added a song for the Squid Sisters who perform in Inkopolis Plaza. We can confirm that the Squid Sisters have new songs and are still active, but what is Off the Hook up to? Inoue. Off the Hook is currently on a world tour, working with damp socks in between. I did see Off the Hook and an Octoling in the trailer for Side Order, the second wave of the expansion pass. Nogami. Yes, that's right. As you may have guessed, they're definitely going to make an appearance. I can't reveal the details yet, but it will be a new story featuring Off the Hook. The gameplay will be different and new, so please look forward to it. I got the feeling that if Team Order won the final Splatfest in Splatoon 2, this is the kind of world it would have been. Inoue. That's right, it's not something that we decided on from the get-go, but when we started creating the expansion pass, we thought that it'd be interesting to create a world of if Team Order had won. By the way, is that Octoling Agent 8? Sato. That still needs to be researched. Holy shit guys, we got new side order information, hashtag real, hashtag not clickbait. Yeah, it sounds like the Splatoon team isn't really ready to say much of anything about the DLC just yet, which is understandable. I'm interested in what this new and different kind of gameplay that Nogami talked about will be. I know they like their three motifs, but I don't think we need a third Octo Expansion style of story mode in a row. Personally, I like the idea of something more puzzle-based, like Portal, and we haven't gotten a lot of that in Splatoon, or something with more stealth. Like the first time I played Octo Expansion, I was blown away by that first section of the escape phases. Now this whole concept of side order being a what if team order had won kind of thing is something that I've seen people bring up, so that's cool that it's confirmed that that's what the developers have in mind for it. In regards to the player character, I'm still inclined to believe that the Octoling is Agent 8. Like, Off the Hook is involved and it seems to be some sort of cerebral memory related thing. And all the customization options on the player character, including the hair and skin tone, match all the promotional art for Agent 8 and Octo Expansion. 
and the player character is even taller than the normal player models that are used in Splatoon 3, which would make sense if this is Agent 8 because at this time they would be around 20 years old. So don't take what Sato said about it still being researched as an outright denial of this character being Agent 8. The Splatoon team has used this kind of wording before when they don't want to talk about something just yet. Got it. Alright, please tell us about your intention to bring back Incorpolis Plaza for the first wave of the expansion pass. Inoi, there were a lot of people who first came to the Splatoon series with Splatoon 2 and Splatoon 3. We wanted to show Splatoon 1 to those who knew of it, but hadn't actually played to see what Incopolis Plaza and the Squid Sisters were really like. When designing the current Incopolis Plaza, did you think of it as how the place would appear seven years after Splatoon 1? Inoi. Yes, it was designed to give the feeling of coming back to your hometown after a seven year absence and seeing that it's changed a bit. There's many parts that seem to have changed, but some things that haven't. You can feel the nostalgia, but you can also see some realistic changes, such as the train station becoming more accessible to those with disabilities. Going back there after seven years, I felt it was surprisingly small. Sato. Well, that's because Splatsville is huge. I think that is a part of growing up. When I was a child, I felt that my elementary school district was huge, but it was a different feeling going back there as an adult. So the Splatoon world moves in real time, and the changes to Inkopolis Plaza is another reflection of this. I thought that bit about how the train station became more accessible was an interesting little touch of realism. Some might not know this, but all these little yellow bumps on the pavement that you can see in Inkopolis Plaza and in real life, are for visually impaired people, so this implies that it's accommodated for in the Splatoon world as well. An extra little piece of trivia while I'm here, located here in Splatoon 1 was the couch co-op mode called the Dojo. In Splatoon 3 it's been replaced with the Shoal, but if you look at the doors, you can see the logo of Splatoon 1's Dojo peeling away. Now for the next section, the attention to detail in game modes other than Turf War. With Salmon Run having the next wave name to it now, how has the game mode evolved? Sato. We took the game in the direction of it being a true evolution of Splatoon 2's Salmon Run. While keeping the fun of the random situations that make Salmon Run so addicting, we've added in new waves of gameplay that make it possible to play longer, like the addition of King Salmonids and Big Run. That's what the next wave subtitle means. Is Big Run to Salmon Run like what Splatfests or the Turf Wars? Sato. Keeping with the chaos theme, we started with the idea of adding some chaos to Salmon Run as well. We thought that Salmonids appearing on Turf War stages would be chaotic, a big deal in the Inkling world. Such an event would be big news, so we thought we could turn that into something like a Splatfest, and that's how Big Run came to be in its current form. Salmon Run was originally held as an event in Splatoon 2, and due to its popularity, it was changed to an almost daily event. Since what used to be an event became a daily thing, we wanted to have a Splatfest-like event with Salmon Run instead. This is something we thought about doing since Splatoon 2, and now we were finally able to make it happen. Is Big Run what was being prophesized about in the Book of Madai that appeared in Splatoon 2's Sunken Scrolls? Inoue. When an extremely large amount of Salmonids go upstream, that's what's called a Big Run. In the past, it's said that cities were destroyed by this terrifying phenomenon. Whether something is upsetting the Salmonids or it's due to abnormal weather patterns, the cause of Big Run is unknown, but the current Big Run situation being experienced is unparalleled to date. Did you have the idea for the current state of Big Run in mind from that time? Inoue. Big Run itself is a different thing since we thought of it after 3 started. However, our thinking from the start was that the Salmonids were ferocious beings that would swim upstream and destroy cities, so the second scroll is to convey that idea. I was very happy to see this question brought up in the interview. During Big Run, if you look in the distance, you can see seven rings with light shining through them, just like what was prophesized in the Book of Madai. And now that we can see that the Seven Rings are a real phenomenon in the Splatoon world, I can't help but wonder what exactly causes those rings, but will we get an answer to that? Uh, who knows. I see. Where the egg cannons develop at Grisco Industries? Inoue. Yes, the golden eggs fired from the egg cannons are a very large source of energy in the Inkling world. 
It's a waste to fire those eggs away, but Grisco had no choice but to harness that energy to compete with the mighty King Salmonids, so that's how those cannons came to be. Sato. First and foremost, Grisco wants us to deliver those precious golden eggs to the basket, so they won't supply egg cannons unless there's a dangerous King Salmonid. How do Kahozunas and Horoboros become King Salmonids? Inoue. It seems that only the most experienced and fierce individuals can become King Salmonids. The King Salmonids are the ones who have survived many battles and have been trained for a long time. Normally, King Salmonids sleep at the bottom of the sea, but when they catch a strong smell of those inklings that they remember invading their territory, they awaken and attack. Now this same piece of information was stated in the Splatoon 3 art book as well. Now I've seen some people question whether or not the King Salmonids are sapient due to how huge and monstrous they look. This has become like a mantra to Salmonid fans, but yes, Salmonids are sapient and intelligent, they are not dumb animals. And this response from Annoy, I believe, means that this applies to King Salmonids too. It seems that they're just... angry. Ouroboros have an especially long body, but is it really a Salmonid? Inoue. There's this very intense waterfall, and Salmonids that successfully climb that waterfall develop a dragon-like body, and are called Horoboros. So you're saying that the process of climbing up the waterfall trains the Salmonid's body to take on that shape? Inoue. That's correct. Horoboros aren't a different species. There's a very well-known Chinese myth about a carp that climbs a waterfall and becomes a dragon. If you know Pokemon, that's what the Magikarp and Gyarados line is based on. The training for a Salmonid to become a Horoboros is based on this myth, and the Japanese name for Horoboros literally just means dragon, which makes the reference even clearer. I'd expect that there will continue to be more kinds of King Salmonids. Are there any plans to implement some kind of forecasting feature to determine which King Salmonids will appear? Sato. Since King Salmonids dive in very deep waters, their ecology is not well understood, even with Grizz Coast technology. If their ecology is clarified someday, their appearances may be able to be accurately predicted, but it seems difficult with current technology. In the future, maybe something like Amedas will be developed. Side note, Amedas is... Automated Meteorological Data Acquisition System. It's technology used by the Japan Meteorological Agency for making weather forecasts. Cool. Looking forward to the development of something like a Salmedas. The gear you get from Salmon Run has a something you've seen somewhere before design to it. Do you have a unified motive in mind for it? Inoue. We wanted to make sure that you could get something distinct from the fashion sold in ordinary stores, so that's why we designed the gear that way. Keeping in relation with Salmonids, the title of the next section is the dry relationship with the small fry in story mode. In story mode, a small fry becomes your player character's partner. What's the story behind their current relationship? Inoue. We started off with the idea of a youth wielding a bow in a chaotic and wild land, accompanied by a dog-like creature. As we were creating the new hero mode with this concept, we thought that we could create a variety of gimmicks by combining the existing gimmicks with the small fry, so the small fry officially became the player's partner. What led the small fry to become partnered with the new Agent 3? Inoue. There wasn't anything dramatic that led up to it. The small fry was one that was lost, straight from its school. It happened to meet Agent 3, a youth who makes a living off of hunting for scrap. The hungry small fry, who will eat just about anything, works together with 3 out of a shared motivation. For that reason, the small fry isn't doted on like a pet. For the love of God, Splatoon team, please stop comparing salmonids to pets, what are you doing? In universe, it's one thing for the inklings to compare salmonids to animals because the inklings are fed that anti-salmonid propaganda. Salmonids and inklings have been in opposition for who knows how long, inklings entering salmonid territory, killing them for their eggs, salmonids entering inkling territory, leaving destruction as they migrate. The inklings have reasons in their own culture to not like salmonids and to not know, or if they know, not to care that the salmonids are a sapient species. They wear clothes, they have a language, compose complex music, they engineer their own weapons and other machinery, conduct trades, celebrate holidays, like there are all these things that point towards the salmonids having human level of intellect with a very different culture. Whether or not the Inklings know these things, the developers do. So for the developers to conceptualize the small fry, a child of the sapient species, akin to a dog, seems kind of... shallow? Continues to uphold the Inkling side of the narrative without question? 
The small fry can sing the Grisco theme and the Calabari incantation. And theoretically could pilot a small aircraft. Can your dog do that? No. Could a human child do this? Yes. If you get me, you get me. If you don't, I sound insane right now. But if you've been on my channel long enough, you should know this is the kind of person I am. In the initial concepts, they straight up had Small Fry on a leash. I'm glad they strayed away from these unfortunately dog-like concepts, but I still don't like that it exists, and those dog-like traits still kind of seeped into Small Fry's behavior and how it's treated in-game. What a surprisingly dry relationship with no references to highly questionable animalizations of an intelligent and sapient species. What a surprisingly dry relationship. With the addition of the small fry, I had the impression that the playstyles that you could experience on the stages were more varied than they were ever before. Inoue. In Splatoon 2, the stages were structured around going from a direct start to finish line, but this time we wanted to make something that would allow for a wider variety of playstyles and elements to experience. We included actions you can do with the small fry, squid surges, zip caster levels, crab tank levels, and so on. The names of the missions in Alterna are kind of like fancy advertising blurbs you'd see for houses and apartments. How did you come to adopt this naming scheme? Inoue. Alterna is an underground shelter created as a new ideal home for the surviving members of the human race. Those kinds of advertising blurbs speak high praises of an ideal home, so I thought that atmosphere would be perfect for the mission names. Incidentally, the naming scheme in English is different, but carries that same sense of excitement. So that question was about the names of the levels in Alterna, and as just mentioned, the English version of the game went with a different naming scheme of idioms and catchy phrases, but the naming scheme in Japanese, it's more like poetic blurbs you'd use to advertise a house or apartment. For example, the stage, octopods at rest tend to flip out is called in Japanese something like providing you with a place of relaxation where small birds gather, and the strings the thing is called relaxation and a sense of openness, a promenade filled with dappled sunlight. It's it's totally different. Do these kinds of advertising blurbs exist in the Inkling world too? Inoue. As Inkling history falls close to the human history, I think they do exist. There's a lot of variety to the scenery of these stages such as metallic or cyberpunk-like environments. Inoue. This is also to tie into the theme of an ideal world. The name of the themes are in the art book, but the motifs include megapolis, brutalism, sunlight filtering through the trees, nostalgia, and other kinds of motifs that would arise when one imagines an ideal world. I'll take a moment to show some of those art book pages Inoue mentioned. By the way, these names of the themes are used internally in Splatoon 3 as well, as the file names for the models of the backgrounds of the Alterna missions. In one of the sunken scrolls, the small fry that was left behind during a big run is called a KG Seminid. Is it a special type of Seminid? Inoue. KG Seminids are special individuals that are rarely born, have the disposition to eat just about anything, and possess the qualities to become a huge fry. In real life as well, only about one of every 10,000 salmon caught are the rare and high-end KG salmon, so this became the motif that we used. If you don't remember what the interviewer is talking about here, you're not crazy. This KG salmonid thing was omitted from the English version of Splatoon 3 Sunken Scroll Number 8 because, frankly, it doesn't really translate. Though, I couldn't tell you why the English version left out the fact that our small fry got separated during not just any salmon run, but a big run. So to explain what KG means, in real life, young chum salmon born in Russian rivers that somehow get separated from their school and get mixed in with salmon that return to Japan to spawn are called KG. Like what Inoue talked about, about 1 in every 10,000 salmon caught are KG, and due to the rarity and desirable fatty flavor and texture, one fish can cost anywhere from 500 to 2,000 US dollars. To tie things back to previous lore, it's been stated that in salmon culture, they prize being fatty, and by extension being delicious, as when it comes to fish, fatty meat does taste better. So maybe our little buddy could be a respectable individual in salmon culture. So this rare individual just so happened to be working with the player character as a partner? Inoue. I mentioned that the small fry was one that got lost. 
but even in real life, a chum salmon that strays from its school can become something special, so there's that factor as well. Was it the effects of the fuzzy ooze that caused the Octarians in Alterna to grow hair? Inoi. Under the effects of the fuzzy ooze, they're on the verge of becoming mammals. In the case of the new Asian 3, when they come into contact with the ooze, they suddenly grow hair. Are the Octarians supposed to be in the middle stage? Inoi. That's right. A map was released showing the location of the Splatlands and Incadia. I thought things like, oh, this area is really Atami. It was interesting to see the geographical relationship between the two regions. Inoi. There are also places that exist but aren't depicted on the map. Sato. It's still undergoing research, so maybe revised in the future to be more geographically correct. Nogami. Yeah, it's still in the process of being mapped out. You're saying it could be redrawn then? In the past on this channel, I made some speculations on where on earth the Splatlands and Inkopolis could possibly be. I always assumed Inkopolis was somewhere in Japan, and then with the Splatlands, I first thought it could be somewhere around the southwest US or even Hong Kong, and then we learned that it's not too far from Inkopolis, so then I thought maybe it could be in Hokkaido based on the shape of this landmass and Mr. Grizz's inspirations. It's been months, so I'm sure there are many who are aware of this by now, but this officially released map confirms the location of the two regions, and we can say with 100% certainty that the games are located around Japan's Kanto region, with Inkopolis right where Tokyo was. How can we be so sure? Aside from resembling that area, there was two versions of this map that was released. One in high resolution, which got released in English as well, and then a lower resolution version that has more written information but didn't get an English translation. This alternate version was, thankfully, released in the art book. In this, this section is labeled as being the Chiba region, and this is labeled as the Yokosuka Peninsula, both of which are real-life place names. Combining that with the statement from the developers that the distance between Inkopolis and Splatsville is akin to that of Tokyo and another city, Atami, it all lines up, even revealing what came of Mount Fuji as well. Some other things labeled on this map include an oasis in the desert called the Atsugi Oasis, and the road to the north labeled as Old Highway Route 108. On this topic, I should mention Splatoon 3 also gave us a world map, a first ever for the series, which can be seen on the back wall of Ammonites and in the finale of Return of the Mammalians. What I'm showing here is the texture used on the model of the Earth. The Earth is still recognizable and the land masses are somewhat intact, there's a lot of oddities from rising sea levels and climate change that have led to, for example, Europe being kind of shaped like a squid, and the Americas resembling a shark and a remora. Since both these maps are meant to just be background elements, I'd imagine it's also subject to slight changes in the event that something like traveling to different parts of the world would be plot relevant. On to the next section, Table Turf. Cards to collect and play. Please tell us about the process and intentions behind the implementation of Table Turf. Nogami. When I was a kid, I liked to collect cards, and there are a lot of people like that, isn't there? In this game, I wanted there to be cards to collect from working at Gruzco and doing battles, and with the excitement from that concept, Table Turf was born as a way to play with those cards. Inoue. Table Turf is an alternative to mini games that we had in the past, like Squid Jump and Squid Beats. We decided on a card game because we wanted to create a game that utilized the rewards available in various situations, such as from the catalog or as rewards from story mode. How is the response from the player base? Nogami. We had hoped that people would enjoy Table Turf as a break from battles in Salmon Run, but we're glad to hear that some people are playing it enthusiastically. Inoue. Table Turf has so much to it that it can hardly be called a minigame. There's this expectation that card games that are a sub-element of a bigger game are usually interesting, and I think we were able to exceed the expectation and made something nice. We're very happy to see that many are playing the game. Sato. We will continue to make improvements to the game, so please play it. We are finally at the last page of this interview, and I omitted a lot of this page because all it talks about is the Koshien tournament in Japan, which really isn't interesting to anyone outside of Japan. So, for the parting words from our developers, Splatoon 3, from here on. What is your outlook for the future of Splatoon 3? Sato. 
We will try to meet the expectations of our players, and we will continue to work on things that will make them think, I didn't see that coming, so from here on, we'll be doing our best. Inoue. Splatoon 3 started with the arrival of the Bankata craze, but now we can go to Inkopolis Plaza and turn into Krakens once more. I hope to show how this mix of the old and new will work together to create another boom in the Inkling world. Nogami. Firstly, we'd like to continue to provide updates season by season. In the process, we hope to prepare some things that will come as a surprise, so please look forward to that. Now, please give a final message to all the fans out there. Nogami. More than half a year has passed since the release of the game, and many people are playing it, for which I am truly grateful. The best thing we can do for the players is to make sure that as many people as possible play in the world of Splatoon 3, so that they can always find someone to play with them when they want to. Whether you have always been playing for a long time or just started recently, we will do our best to make sure that everyone can enjoy the game in a variety of ways. Inoue. It's been almost eight years since the release of Splatoon in 2015, and the Inkling's world has expanded so much since then that it's hard to predict where it will go next. This is due in no small part to the players that battle it out as Inklings and Octolings, take on jobs at Grizzco, and enjoy Splatfests. In the time of the first game, I transmitted a lot of messages to the Inkling world, but now I feel like as I've become a part of the Inkling's world, I hope to continue to enjoy this world together with our fans. Sato. From the time of the first Splatoon game, we have always believed that completion is not the end, but rather that the game is only possible with the support of everyone who plays it. That's something that won't change in the future. We will continue to do our best so that not only those who have played Splatoon up until now, but also those who have just started playing can enjoy it as well. And that's the end. Seriously, thank you to my Patreon patrons for continuing to support me despite how infrequently I've been uploading lately. I really appreciate it. And thanks to anyone here for watching to the end of what I'm hoping will be my longest video. I keep telling myself that I should stop making videos that are so long, and then I don't stop. I'm thinking of making more of these kinds of videos where I go over developer interviews in depth, but also that requires a lot of copying and pasting text into my editing software, which is like the number one thing that makes it slow down and crash for some reason. So I might have to wait till I'm not using a six-year-old laptop that's literally held together with tape. But also I have many other ideas for Splatoon lore topics to cover in video form that shouldn't make my computer explode. Slowly but surely, I will get around to those. Again, thanks for watching, and whenever it may be, I will see you